the reason that Joe Biden, because I, I just went over in that very short clip, maybe 45 seconds, every word out of the man's mouth was a lie. Every single one. And the reason that it was all a lie is because he knows if he tells you the truth, he can't make his case. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell that supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Now you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. Our daily dose of stupid is from Joe Biden who announces that there are going to be more measures when it comes to gun control. Yay. Anyway, he signed an executive order earlier this week that would ban ghost guns. Now, ghost guns is a scary name that people made up to make guns sound scarier than they actually are. What an actual ghost gun is, or at least that's the this is what they call it, is a gun that was made in a person's house or made outside of a corporation. Now, here's the silly thing about this. I thought that leftists didn't like corporations. I thought that they did not want corporations to have more rights than other people. We heard this in Citizens United. They said, well, a, a corporation should not have more power and more rights than a person, more than an individual. Which, by the way, on some level, I actually do agree with. I think that a corporation ought to have the same rights as an individual person. But why is it that they abandon that belief when it comes to making guns, they think only a corporation should have the right to make and keep and bear arms. They think that only corporations should be able to manufacture guns. Wasn't well, that giving all of the power to the corporations? Now, the truth is that they do want that. They want gun companies, which they can control and can regulate, to be able to make guns for them to arm the police officers and people in the military to enforce their will on the American people. And I know that most people in our military and police officers are good people that would not do that. I'm just saying that that's ideally what they would like because, of course, all socialism is coercion. It's all force, and it requires a complacent military and or police force and able to enact it. But nonetheless, they do want guns. They just want them in the hands of certain people. And the only way that they can do that is if they control all of them and only they get to say who can and cannot make a gun. That's why they like the idea of there being a rule against this. But it violates their stated principle of, well, a corporation shouldn't have more rights than a person. Okay, if you're saying that only a corporation has the right to make something, but if a private individual makes it, then it's illegal, then what are we doing here? Because if that's the case, you're breaking your own law. <laughs> If, if that's the case, you're breaking your own stated value that corporations should not have more power than individuals. Well, I'm sorry if you think that only corporations should be allowed to make guns, which would give them quite a bit of power, then yeah, you, you don't believe that. I'm sorry. And I know that somebody in the comment section is going to come back with, well, what about moonshine? No, actually, I'm against moonshine laws. I think if a person wants to make their own alcohol, that's their business. Kind of hard to pin a libertarian to the wall on that one. But anyway, <laughs> um, that that really is how they think of it. And they will see, here's what it's actually going to. This is the purpose of this law. They do, It is about control, and they do want to make sure that the private citizen is incapable of creating a weapon to defend himself because then they get to regulate all of the guns and they get to regulate whether or not you have a firearm a firearm or not, but they will soon be coming after gun assemblies. So there's certain rifles and, and platforms that you can buy that you can buy them in parts and assemble the rifle yourself. You don't buy the whole gun as a unit. You will buy the individual parts. And by the way, this does take some skill to do, but it's it's not terribly complicated, especially in our modern world with, with mass-produced parts. You can, if you're relatively competent, buy the parts of an AR-15 slowly over time and assemble it, and it would be more difficult to trace back to you because you didn't have to go through a background check in order to obtain that since you built it yourself. So, I, I, I really don't have a problem with that because here's the thing. Do, do we know of any kind of crime where this is an issue? Because, first of all, we know that the vast majority of guns that are are used in crimes, I mean, it's it's more than two to one compared to all other guns, is handguns. 
And handguns, you can't really do that with. I mean, I guess you could theoretically buy the individual parts, but really most of them aren't for sale. It would be very difficult to assemble your own handgun by yourself. And so that knocks out most of gun crime. But to my knowledge, I've never even heard of a case of a mass shooter or even gang violence resulting from somebody who was making guns. Some have been illegally modified, but as far as just straight up making a gun, I, I don't know of any cases of that. There are probably some out there, but they're so minuscule that I've never even heard of them before. And so this does nothing to help solve gun violence, does nothing to help prevent mass shootings. I don't know if there's ever been a mass shooting in the history of this country that was committed with a ghost gun. But nonetheless, this is what they push forward. And then Joe Biden, when he's announcing his new gun control measures, I mean, as to be expected, he kind of falls all over himself. Take a listen. Nothing, nothing I'm about to recommend in any way impinges on the Second Amendment. Oh, I bet it's going to. Phony arguments suggesting that these are Second Amendment rights at stake from what we're talking about. Are they? But no amendment, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. <laughs> you can't yell crowd, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. We call a freedom of speech. From the very beginning, you couldn't own any weapon you wanted to own. From the very beginning, the theory. Second Amendment existed. Certain people weren't allowed to have weapons. Also not so true. the idea is just bizarre to suggest that some of the things we're recommending are contrary to the Constitution. Uh, it, it takes, I've said this a thousand times, it takes talent to be wrong that much in such a short amount of time. Like, it, it's actually impressive that you can be that wrong that many different times in only about a 45-second clip. So, first of all, let's deal with the big and most obvious one when he says that all amendments... You know, the amendments are not absolute. Yeah, they are. That's what unalienable means. If a right is an unalienable right, which is what our Declaration of Independence says about human rights and God-given rights, then that means they cannot be taken away. That's about as absolute as it gets. That means that nobody has the right to infringe upon them. That means that you yourself can't even infringe upon your own rights. I mean, you can't get rid of them, per se. You could choose not to exercise them, I suppose. But you can't, like, you can't um, give up, for example, your right to free speech. It's inherent. It is inborn. You can't do anything to change it. You can choose not to exercise it, but you cannot eliminate it from your being. And the Second Amendment is no exception to this. The rights and the amendments are absolute. That's what it means to be inalienable. That's what it means to believe in God-given rights. Now, the Democrats, of course, do not believe in this, but that's the point. It's showing the distinction between the two. They believe that your rights are really just kind of uh, guidelines. Maybe we should hang on to them, but yeah, let's make some exceptions because it's not like, you know, they're absolute or in concrete or anything. No, no, they are. That's the point of it being a right. A right is something that nobody had to give you. You were given to it by God, and no man has the right to take it from you. That's about as absolute a concept as it gets. You can no more stop having a right to free speech than you could stop being a human being. That's not something that you are capable of doing. And it's not something that the government, the government should recognize those rights and protect them. But even if they infringe upon them, they cannot remove them from you. And that is really... At the end of the day, that is what is under, the most important thing that he says here. But Joe Biden does not believe you have rights. He does not believe your rights are inherent. He does not believe they come from God. The left believes that rights come from government. And because government gave you those rights, they have the right to take them away at any time they want. And that's exactly what they plan on doing. If he didn't believe that, he wouldn't be doing this. And I love that. That brings me to my, my second sort of observation here. I love how he goes on this thing. He's like, it's uh, it's not a pudding. It's not a Second Amendment violation. Uh, the I uh, the idea that this is a Second Amendment violation is is ridiculous and it's phony. It's a phony argument. Also, no right is absolute. Come on, man. I'm like, wait, but you just said that. What? 
you say this isn't a violation of the Second Amendment, and then you go on to make the case that, but if we do violate the Second Amendment, it's okay because it's not an absolute, right? Why the need to say that this is not going to impede the Second Amendment, that this is not a violation of the Second Amendment, and then say, but it's not like the amendment is absolute. That, that, that makes no sense. It, it would be like me saying, okay, what I'm about to say isn't a violation of Scripture, um, but, you know, it's not like Scripture is set in stone or anything. Well, I, I would have no need to make the second case if the first case were true. And I would have no need to make the second case if the first case were true. I'm not saying that they're contradictory. I'm saying that if he really believed that this was not a violation of the Second Amendment, he wouldn't have had to say, by the way, this is not a violation of the Second Amendment. Oh, and also, even if I do violate the Second Amendment, it's cool because it's not like, you know, they're absolutes or anything. Y there's no need to say both of those things. The truth is, it is a violation of the Second Amendment, and he knows that, which is the reason that he hedges his language. And ultimately, I love that he uses this old, tired argument that's one of the dumbest arguments you can make. Well, the First Amendment is an absolute because you're not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. Uh, not true. You are allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater when there's a fire. You see, when there's a fire, yelling fire in a crowded theater is not only allowed, it's a good thing to do. When you yell cr fire in a crowded theater and there's no fire, what you are being prosecuted on is not the fact that you said the word fire or that you exercised your free speech. It's saying that free speech cannot be used as a shield to allow you to incite a riot. In the same way that you're not allowed to incite a riot using other terms, like, you know, Funny Man did in, in Birmingham saying we need to tear some bleep down. You're not allowed to use free speech as a shield against committing another crime. If, for example, I hire a hitman, and all I told him is, I'll pay you X amount of dollars if you kill this person for me, and then they go out and murder that person, I can't say, oh, well, free speech, I didn't actually go out and kill the person. They're not prosecuting your speech, moron. They're prosecuting the action that you use to hurt another person. The speech is not what is under fire here. And so that's not a loophole or an exception to the First Amendment. It's just saying you can't use the First Amendment to justify committing other crimes. <laughs> like, you can't use that as a shield. In the same way that you couldn't just run up to a random person, shoot them in the face, and go like, I have a right to keep and bear arms. You have a right to keep and bear them. That doesn't give you the right to murder people. You can't, you can't commit crimes and then use the amendments as shields. That's not what's going on here. He's saying that your right to have the thing in the first place should be curtailed. That's completely different than what Joe Biden is suggesting here when it comes to gun control. And it's, I, I hate that stupid fire in a crowded theater argument because it's so easily broken and yet people continue to use it over and over again as though it's a good argument. Uh, but also another thing that he said, he said, well, you know, back at the, the time of the founding, it's not like people um, could, could just have any weapon they wanted. Um, yeah, pretty much they could. Uh, let's observe this first of all. The, we often hear this talking point from the left. They say that, well, the First Amendment was only supposed to be used for things like muskets because that was the standard weapon of the day. Yeah, the Revolutionary War was fought with muskets, which means that all the people that owned muskets had military equipment. And so if we are going to make that analogous to today, if we were going to enact the same rules and the same standard that we had back then, then everybody should be allowed to have an M16 rifle. Now, those are illegal in the United States of America unless you are literally a, a millionaire and can afford the thousands upon thousands of dollars it takes to get an automatic weapons license to be able to own an M16. But my point in all of that is, if the standard is going to be we need to bring it back to the way it was when this thing was written and ratified in the 1790s, um, if that's the standard we're going with, then everybody needs to have military-grade equipment. But, but let's take, you know, our mind off of the musket here for a second. They act as though there were not more powerful weapons in existence and that those whip weapons would have been banned by the founders. The only problem is that is simply not the case. I want you to take a look at these weapons. These are all from the 1790s. These 
uh, were all weapons that were had been made and manufactured and invented pre-existing the 1790s. And yes, private citizens in the United States owned them. I don't know for a fact if any American owned a puckle gun. I, I can't imagine there weren't at least one or two people that had one, but the rest of them certainly were. So the first one you have up there um, on the left is the Belton flint flintlock. It could fire 12 shots. It was a flintlock uh, style musket, yes, but it could fire multiple shots without having to reload. Uh, you have the Ghiridoni air rifle there on the bottom right, uh, directly across from that. That one could fire 20 shots in a very short amount of time. Then on the left, you've got the thing that looks like something out of a fantasy with all the different barrels on it. That's called a pepper box pistol. And uh, that was also something available to the founders. And, and there were people that owned them even in the Revolutionary War and, and in the army and, and people that were not in the army. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the puckle gun up there on the top right. And that, you know, that was sort of the precursor to the machine gun. Now, it took a lot longer to fire a second shot than a machine gun. But the point is, you could fire off about nine shots in a minute. That was significantly faster than a musket. And yet, despite all of this, do you know how many of those were outlawed at the time of the Constitution? None of them. Not one. In fact, Lewis and Clark carried the Ghiridoni air rifle. This was something that Thomas Jefferson was kind of an enthusiast about and not only allowed them to have them, it was enthusiastic about them having them. He's like, yeah, take one of them. This is something that people, they, they lie to you because they know that their argument cannot stand on its own. And I also ask you to consider this and, and this idea that, oh, well, not just anybody could own a weapon and you weren't allowed to own any weapon that you wanted. I want you to consider this as well. This is a letter of marquee from James Madison, you know, the guy that wrote the Bill of Rights. This is a letter of marquee from James Madison when there was a private company, not a government contractor or anything like that, a private company that kept getting their stuff stolen from England because this happened in 1812. And they were asking him, hey, do, do we have permission to actually, you know, have cannons on our ship? Because I know we're not a government ship and... He's like, yeah, you can have a warship if you want to. We have a Second Amendment. That letter of marquee was specifically given to them saying, yeah, you, you can have that. That's fine. And in fact, he said it, the, the letter was actually not to give permission for the cannons because they already had that. The letter was to give them commission. And I love this. Basically to say that they are allowed to fire upon enemy ships if they come in contact with them and they are allowed to either sink them or to bring those people into custody. So he said, not only are you allowed to have military grade cannons on your ship, but I'm also saying that you have my permission, even as private citizens to basically uh, take war criminals and uh, engage in a citizen's arrest of enemy combatants in the water. And so there's no question when it comes to this, that the founders absolutely when they thought about the Second Amendment, they believed that that is something that was extended to private citizens, including military-grade equipment. So Joe Biden is simply incorrect on that, just like he was on everything else. And finally, he said, well, not just any citizen could own a firearm. Uh, yeah, they could. They could. There, there was nobody that was specifically barred from owning a firearm at the time of the founding. The founders didn't believe in that. Now, there were people that were, for example, incarcerated for crimes of violence that weren't allowed to have them, but that's also true today. His law would not change that. If somebody has shown that they have been irresponsible with the right to keep and bear arms, then those arms can be taken away from those. Those rights can be curtailed based on their actions. What Joe Biden is suggesting is new laws that would, uh, would be sweeping and apply to every citizen, whether they've done anything wrong or not. The founders did have certain people that were in prisons that weren't allowed to have firearms, but that's because they had already violated their own rights. They had already violated the rights of another person and thus had to have their rights curtailed. That's not what Joe Biden is suggesting here. And so the idea that, well, not just anybody could have one. Uh, yeah, unless they committed a crime, anybody could have a firearm back then. And many of them made their own, the ghost guns that Joe Biden is so afraid of and now trying to come up with legislation to prevent that from happening. And if you don't believe me on this, all you need to do is go to the words of George Mason. 
who was known as the father of the Bill of Rights, statesman from Virginia. He said that when someone asked him who is the militia, referring to the Second Amendment, he said the militia is the whole of the people. Private citizens, everybody's the militia. Every American citizen is the militia. And so that was George Mason's stance on it. He was kind of important to the Bill of Rights being written. And so, yeah, anybody, the whole of the American people, according to George Mason, were allowed to have these firearms. Here's the thing. The reason that Joe Biden, because I, I just went over in that very short clip, maybe 45 seconds, every word out of the man's mouth was a lie. Every single one. And the reason that it was all a lie is because he knows if he tells you the truth, he can't make his case. He knows if he is honest with the American people and he gives proper context and actually explains this thing in a rational way, he knows he will not be able to make the case to get the legislation that he wants. That is why he has to lie, because leftist talking points don't make sense unless you lie about them. And that's especially true with the Second Amendment. All I do is give you the facts. Why? Because I'm confident in my case. I'm confident that you are smart enough that when you see the facts presented before you, that you can make your own decisions and your own conclusions. And because I know my argument is good and strong, I don't have to worry about it. I can tell you the truth. Let the chips fall what they may, where they may and have confidence they will fall in my favor. Joe Biden knows that if he makes this case honestly, his case won't make any sense. So he has to lie about it. <laughs> To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>